Well, um, this week we're going to talk about a couple different topics. The election, of course, is still with us. Um, and then we're also going to turn our attention to Airbnb, uh, which has been a um, topic of some interest lately in Palo Alto. Um, Johnny, let's start with the election and uh, let's start with the Chamber of Commerce. They, they threw uh, something in the water, a, I don't know, a stone in the water that's had many ripple effects recently. Amazing. 25 days to go and things are getting really exciting now. <laughs> contributions, accusations. Uh, media bias claims, you know, it's like a little mm -hmm. microcosm of what's happening in the nation. But, uh, and of course, people being compared to Trump now on both sides of the aisle. So oh, okay. that's different since this last time we talked about it. But uh, we can start with the chamber, sure. which um, entered the debate uh, last week. Um, October 4th, they sent out a mailer to its, or an email to its members, basically encouraging them to support four um, council candidates, but expressly specifying they're not endorsing anybody. Not an endorsement. Which probably has George Orwell turning over in his grave, but it is consistent <laughs> with the Chamber's bylaws, uh -huh. because even though they cannot endorse, they could, um, as CEO Judy Kleinberg told me, go all the way up to endorsing. But not, and that's what they, they did, did in this case. did not cross the line. Yeah, so everyone not affiliated with the Chamber believes this is basically a non-endorsement endorsement. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of whatever you call it. Yeah. But anyway, Adrian Fine, Liz Ness, Don McDougall, and Greg Tanaka are the four candidates called out in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And um, the chamber letter that you referenced not only kind of tells people to support these people or to consider supporting these people, mm -hmm. it also makes some kind of sweeping uh, generalizations about some of the people it's not supporting, mm -hmm. including the mayor, which was really interesting because... <laughs> who's two, not running. <laughs> who's not running. And this is like a former mayor and a current mayor, neither of whom are running the election, but they're the center of this kind of mm -hmm. big election conflict. So she basically said that the current mayor is calling for a ban on high-tech workers downtown. Mm -hmm. which is, um, that is springboarding off of some comments he made over the summer. Yeah, he made some comments saying, uh, basically saying that the current zoning code uh, appears to not support research and development use in the downtown district. Mm -hmm. So you need to revise the code to more accurately reflect the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. And, the reality uh, on the ground, I should say, is Palantir. <laughs> <laughs> Palantir and uh, the, the few startups that haven't been choked out of that space yet. Yeah. But, um, and basically, uh, some of the council candidates, if elected, reading from the letter, mm -hmm. could create a majority in the council to pass such a ban, which again... Mm. Is, is, so, um, obviously, the people who support more slow growth candidates immediately came out against the chamber. And, mm -hmm. um, and from what I could tell, the reason council contributions since the letter came out, there hasn't really been an outpouring of cash for these candidates from the chamber from the business members side. or people. So it might have yeah. uh, might have backfired in some ways. Hmm. So for the four candidates who were supported, not endorsed, um, were the reasons given for supporting them or was it much more of a don't, don't elect the other viable candidates? Um, there's several smart people running, the letter says. Okay. So they're smart, that's a reason. Mm -hmm. And it says they have a more balanced approach and a stronger appreciation of the way businesses work. Mm -hmm. So they would, they would work to protect and promote local commercial enterprise, big and small, from over-regulation. So that's mm -hmm. kind of oh. reading from the letter. Okay. It's nothing too specific about policies, just sure. they would take a more balanced approach kind of thing. It kind yeah. of strikes me as a little odd considering the Chamber of Commerce I always would... S my sense is that it, that it represents a lot of smaller businesses or retail businesses, and here you have giant companies like Palantir coming in or, you know, taking over, basically converting. We've had this problem of conversion of retail space into office space and so mm -hmm. that they seem to be promoting people who might continue those practices, do you think? Uh, perhaps. I mean, I, I haven't seen that many, like, small retailers when I used to go to uh, chambers, public policy discussions more often. It was mostly kind of usual group of, you know, about a dozen people, Garden Court Hotel, kind of, mm -hmm. some, some law firms. A few retailers would show up, but um, I don't think the chamber specifically kind of or officially targets one group over the other. It's just um, the people who make up its board tend to be business professionals as opposed to kind of mom and shop owners. Mm -hmm. I think it is um, unusual, though, that the chamber made any kind of statement this year in, in the election because um, they've been, they've refrained in the past. They've, they've stepped up a little bit on what business registry, business tax issues. Yeah, they opine on policy issues. Mm -hmm. Usually um, the, the office cap they're very skeptical about. Mm -hmm. um, the business, business license tax, uh, in 2009 they had a huge campaign against it. Mm -hmm. So they took a clear stance. Uh, more recently they were, they were a little bit kind of um, 
I wouldn't say opposed, but very kind of skeptical about the new business registry because they feared it uh, would lead to a business tax, which to their <laughs> credit, <laughs> just right. <laughs> we'll see. Right. Um, so they may have gotten that right. But um, yeah. what's really, really unusual is them singling out candidates for people to um, almost endorse, mm -hmm. <laughs> to almost endorse candidates mm -hmm. to basically say these four consider supporting them. That's uh, just don't see that very much. Uh, the fact that uh, Judy Kleinberg is a former mayor and she's the CEO of the chamber, do you think that has something to do with the assertiveness of the chamber putting out its views in this uh, election? Undoubtedly to me, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she, she knows the, the political scene as well as anybody. I feel like uh, her predecessors uh, were, were kind of uh, more tacit in their uh, kind of chamber policies. They were more about kind of facilitating meetings and kind of doing the run-of-the-mill chamber work. Uh, networking stuff. Networking, you know, sp sponsoring luncheons to honor, you know, good business leaders, that kind of stuff. But but she she, she knows the policy. She helped craft some of them. And yeah, she's been she's been out there, like, during, during these big discussions, she, she would go to meetings and kind of use her time to kind of you know, take more aggressive stances and kind of yeah. let the feelings be known. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about reaction. Um, the four council candidates, did they say anything about being non not quite endorsed? <laughs> Did they the ever? <laughs> no, well, they, they, were, they seemed to be as surprised as anyone else was. Oh, no. I think Adrian Fine was actually here for his endorsement interview that day that came out, and, and right. he actually said, well, the chamber endorsed me, and she's like, what? <laughs> was kind of just, uh, Liz Nisk called me and was basically, told me that she was kind of very surprised because there was no endorsement process, the usual thing where you go to interviews or you fill out questionnaires, you kind of know this is coming. She basically said she was completely shocked by it, she, and she went very public with that, <laughs> like so. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm guessing, the, oh, Don McDougall, well. yeah, he actually made a comment at the end of a, a League of Women Voters Forum, which was like, either the night of or the following day after the statement came out, and he basically said, uh, I cannot vouch for any accuracies or inaccuracies in that statement. He clearly, like, didn't... Uh, didn't align himself with what the chamber said. Mm -hmm. Haven't talked to Greg Tanaka, but I mean, I'd be shocked if his experience was different. Because yeah. clearly, yeah. since this wasn't an endorsement, the chamber had no reason to tell these people that they'll be not endorsing That's them. That's true, yeah. It was so, a, a, no so, pro a lack of process. There. So this seemed a little surprised, I mm -hmm. guess, to put were, it. Were they, in a sense, backing away, do you think, from, from the chamber's non-endorsement? Non do they kind of not want to be singled out in that way? Backing away or running away, depending on <laughs> who you ask. Uh, yeah, I mean, they seem quite uncomfortable, so yeah. Okay. Well, from the chamber to, uh, to money, let's talk about some of the contributions that we've seen. Uh, easy flow. transition. <laughs> They're all about the money. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I mean, last time we reported on the contributions was at the end of September when mm -hmm. every candidate filed 460s, the form 460, which basically lays out all the money to date. And Liz Ness and Greg Tanaka were leading the pack at that time. Since then, we had a, few, uh, a little turnaround. Um, basically, Lydia Koo and Arthur Keller, who are affiliated with the more slow growth camp in, in this race, they received a few really big contributions, like a series of six thousand dollar checks. You know. Each one got a little over thirty thousand dollars just wow. just since then, mm -hmm. and just for sense of scale, like um, like I think uh, Liz Miss and Greg Tanaka both had like in the forty thousand forty some thousand range kind of at the so end of September. At the end of September, mm -hmm. so getting thirty thousand in the two weeks is kind of a good chunk of change for like a yeah. a local race. So um, yeah, uh, Lydia Koo got thirty two thousand four hundred dollars since then. Mm -hmm. Ke uh, Keller got thirty one thousand five hundred, and it's all from like just six people in. Keller's case and seven from from Koo's case and mm -hmm. um, the retired people, the professionals, uh, residents from Crescent Park who are like people who have expressed concern before about parking problems. Uh, I know the paper today had a link with Casalea, which I don't see, but right. except for that, another paper few, had that. Yeah, few mm -hmm. hap a few happen to have found a correlation between somebody being on the board at some point. But yeah, so it's, but uh, I see it more as just people who are kind of have residential leanings, so they're supporting mm -hmm. the two people who are promising limiting growth and kind of protecting mm -hmm. people from Are these people who have been um, on uh, boards or commissions or they've been civically active beyond expressing concerns about specific issues? Uh, not so much. They're not part kind of, of the political establishment. More from, more from the private sector. And Marianne Baker, I think she's a philanthropist, she, d she gave 6500 to Kuhl. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe she's spoken out before because she lives in Crescent Park and she's worried about the parking problems. 
So her donating to Lydia Ku, who talks about this theme all the time, doesn't mm -hmm. raise the huge red flags. Yeah, like, there's an alignment there. <laughs> it's like, yeah, philosophy. Thomas Layton, you know, or, or, or Gabriel Layton, you know, they, they were on the RPP task force, they live mm -hmm. in downtown north, concerned about development. Yeah, yeah uh, Tench Cox is a venture capitalist, I haven't heard him talk much about oh, yeah. development mm -hmm. issues. He has spoken out about something, I <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't recall immediately. Uh, Helen McLean, uh, I don't know, donated 6,000 each. But th those are the people. She's retired. But um, yeah, no one really who's been serving on, con on commissions. But Helen is the wife of <laughs> Asher Waldfogel, who mm -hmm. kind of sides with the residential as part of the planning commission. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, there's kind of a philosophical alignment in that sense. Yeah. yeah. At least indirectly. Yeah. Um, 6,500, 6, is that the cap that. Um on contributions? Is that the limit? I'm not exactly sure. In some cases, they gave multiple contributions that added up to that. Hmm. Uh, I think the highest amount from anybody was 6,500. So. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Anything else interesting on the on the money front as far as the election goes? Well, as I mentioned in the past, um, like uh, yeah, just a few minutes ago, the, the chamber's call for didn't, didn't seem to have much of an effect. But but uh, I feel like Greg Tanaka and Adrian Fine did get some contributions from. High tech people. Uh, I mean, they got. I guess Greg Tanaka got great review from the Yelp CEO. Got him, gave him a thousand dollars, and Liz Niz did too. They, yeah. they each got a thousand dollars. But for Niz, that was the only contribution to this late September the she reported. Yeah. So it's not like. Um, and 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 some of the people who donated them since then, and since the chamber letter, seem to be kind of philosophically aligned with them anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Young professionals, techies. Yeah. Adrian Fine got ten thousand dollars from Adrian Fine, which also makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but it seems, and uh, one last thing I should point out, I, I went back to two years ago and looked at um, who was leading the pack then, yeah. and the two leaders were A.C. Johnson and Lydia Koo. So, wow. well, so really? while, while we could spend a lot of time talking about money here, uh -huh. in a local race like this where there's no television commercials, or, uh, yeah. there's not a clear correlation that that's actually going to translate to a huge vote turnaround, because as we know, neither Lydia one of them AC were elected. Ultimately elected. Yeah. So, yeah. grain of salt. Required. <laughs> yeah, I should say, while well, we're talking about election stuff, that we have our uh, endorsement interviews posted on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So um, if people want to know more about the candidates and what they stand for, um, they can go to youtube.com slash PA Weekly. And this week is our City Council Candidates Edition. Mm -hmm. um, and with a handy dandy chart of where mm -hmm. everyone stands and you know, profiles of the 11 candidates. Um, so people can check that out as well. Um, Let's move on to a, a topic that was at the council, and this was last week, um, and it's much discussed. It's been talked about not only here in Palo Alto, but throughout the country, um, Airbnb. Right. Well, we had a situation in which um, apparently a gentleman would, says that he's unable to rent out his home uh, just to one person anymore and needs to have rent money. So Because some, it's too expensive, nobody wants to I gather, yeah, it. it's gotten to be too expensive. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he has, um, basically he was approached by two men who run um, Airbnb homes in other, in other cities, in Redwood City, I believe Mountain View, and um, they said, well, we could you know, basically manage this property for you and uh, have a master lease, and the plan was to put in, um, basically, to rent out to as many as 14 people. So this, uh, this is a, a two-bath, three-bedroom house. Hmm. So this created wow. quite a stir for um, the neighbors. Uh, um, the man involved in this basically said, you know, told his neighbors what the plan was. And so they came out to the council. They wrote lots of letters to the city. Um, they came out to the council meeting, and they, and they stood up and said, you know, we absolutely can't have anything like this, and we really need to have um, more laws, or, you know, more regulations if the city doesn't have anything in place to, uh, to basically make this, you know, to make it so these types, types of things don't happen. And this is not the first, you know, this isn't the only thing. I think it's, it's bubbling up again. I think, I believe it was 2013 when the city, was it 2013 when the city looked at this last? Do you remember? 2015, 2015? it was raised in 2000, late 2014. Okay, so yeah. it was raised, it's been raised for a few years, or three years at least, but the council looked at it and said it's not a big, it's not a big enough problem to really bother with right now, so we'll just defer doing any more real examination or any more And that was ordinances. March 2015 that they right. said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the problem now is that they, uh, that there are more people. There's a, there have been, there was a house recently um, on Newell Road, on the corner of Newell and Embarcadero, 
uh, that is putting in, put in a request to put in, uh, they want to raise the house and put in a house with, I believe it was um, up to 14 bathrooms and I think 10 bedrooms or something like that, mm -hmm. and I have a one car garage, parking garage. And people were just furious about that. They said, you know, when you've got a basement that you plan to put in bedrooms in the basement, and it's, um, you know, almost the entire size and square footage of the house, how can you just say that you're just going to put in your family? Right. And this has been, you know, right. there was another house also in Barron Park a couple of years ago, same type of situation. Someone wanted to put in, um, I believe it was uh, 10 bedrooms in that one as well, or eight bedrooms and 10 bathrooms or something like that. So, uh, you know, we, Palo Alto is always, we've always had lots of, lots of large houses, and, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, where do you draw the line and what, and what is the usage, I think, is a yeah. big question a lot of people have. Yeah, so regionally speaking, I mean, this issue has been addressed. Um, I saw an episode of Portlandia in which they were talking about <laughs> <laughs> this. So, it's, uh, you know, it's clearly an issue that's bubbling up all over. San Francisco um, has mm -hmm. some uh, restrictions now. I mean, they've actually taken steps which have only been discussed at this point uh, amongst council candidates it seems in Palo Alto. Yeah um, I mean in San Francisco has been a huge topic and topic of elections and Airbnb threw in so much money to kind of get well, rid it's of proposed there. regulations. Yeah. yeah right and it, it actually you mentioned the endorsement videos it is a topic that uh, was discussed by every candidate <laughs> yeah. pretty much all of them uh, support regulating Airbnb requiring permits mm -hmm. getting more money a few of From them. Taxes, yeah. A few of them said we should make a trip up the highway to San Francisco to the Airbnb <laughs> headquarters and demand uh, our hotel taxes or whatever, yeah, or whatever yeah, fees yeah. were owed. So I think it's safe to say that um, regulations are coming next year or in two years or however long it takes Palo Alto to make them. Mm -hmm. I think the endorsement interviews that I hope people will see for themselves make it clear that whoever gets elected, that's yeah. that's going to reemerge. Yeah, I didn't see any evidence. I mean, certainly the council, the, all of these statements that they made, that the public made were basically made during the public comment period. It wasn't right. on the agenda, so the council right. couldn't address it. Exactly. But have you had any sense, even from this council, uh, of willingness to, you know, to re-engage in this topic? Well, Liz Ness is part of this council, and she's uh, happy to re-engage with this topic. She supports yeah. permits and reg regulations. And, I mean, the situation has evolved since March 2015. We had these high-profile cases, which you uh, recapped so well, and then... Um, and. And in addition, I feel like uh, in 2015, it wasn't so much that they decided it's a non-issue. It just staff was overloaded with a million projects, the comp plan and everything else. And the council decided that there's certain other things like the office cap that need to mm -hmm. be urgently prioritized. And staff would monitor uh, and see if this becomes more of a problem. Safe to say, even without staff monitoring, I, I don't know how diligent they're monitoring, but citizens have identified it as clearly a problem. So right. so even last year there was recognition that this is something that, that's going to come back again after mm -hmm. some monitoring. Mm -hmm. And um, nothing in the candidate interviews convinced me that that's not going to change. And if anything, they're probably going to be more aggressive because of these recent episodes. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of interesting. A, a couple of years ago when I wrote a story about this big project, uh, actually it was a hacker house in uh, College Terrace. And uh, I forget how many people were in that one, mm -hmm. 14 people or so. And um, when I asked the city about what kind of regulations were in place, and they basically said, well, we can't regulate, you know, the number of, of um, non-related people in a house and so on and so forth. And they really didn't seem to have expressed that they had any real hammers. But this time around, with the house in um, Crescent Park, they did send out an, uh, a letter to the owner and property mm -hmm. owner basically said, you know, you've got this the transient uh, occupancy tax that you are not paying essentially, and uh, you can't have short-term rentals, which the city doesn't allow for less than 30 days. Yeah, let's so. pick that apart for a second. Um, so, uh, the, so, so the homeowner didn't actually start on this plan yet. He let no. people know. People yeah. said no, and then he That's got right. a letter from the city um, and, and yeah. turned around and is not doing that. Right. Um, but the municipal code defines a single family home in an R1 zone as one in which there's a, a single housekeeping unit. Right. I love that. <laughs> housekeeping <laughs> unit, yeah. <laughs> Makes you think of people wearing aprons and having Alice little <laughs> right. rooms or something. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, ho and hotels, uh, it, by contrast, are places where people come and go and rent for less than 30 days. So, I mean, right. technically anyone who's renting out through Airbnb right now is um, not following municipal code. Uh, for their house if they're in a R1 zone. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big difference between just rent, having your housekeeping unit of, you know, mom, 
dad and the kids mm -hmm. uh, or a, a senior citizen and then uh, renting out one room and having a constant revolving door of people. This is, this is something that a lot of people brought up. Yeah, there's the also council. kind of yeah. layers or levels right. of that, that's, rental. You really can't consider uh, people coming in every week or every two weeks to be a housekeeping unit when you've got you know, six or seven or 14 people. Mm -hmm. And they're constantly changing. And as one person put out, they may not even know each other's names. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think that's one, one way that you could define it for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think San Francisco has a ban on absentee uh, landlords uh, renting. Right, yeah. Right. You, have to, yeah. you have to be live, live in that house. I think it's like 275 or something like that in the high 200s days per year. You have to actually be there yeah. in order to engage with Yeah, I'm not sure how they can enforce it. I don't, I don't know if they have anchor well. bracelets on Airbnb owners. I doubt <laughs> it. But, but that's, that's the law. If you're an absentee, you can't, you yeah. can't just run your house like a hotel. Yeah. Um, code enforcement is definitely one thing that some of the council candidates um, talked about, which was, okay, so what, is, so what are some of the problems that come from Airbnb besides the fact that it's not supposed to be used, houses aren't supposed to be used this way? I mean, what are the concerns of neighbors? Uh, well, the concerns of neighbors, at first, first, of all, first and foremost, are parking. That's mm -hmm. a major problem. Mm -hmm. And traffic. Mm -hmm. And just the idea that you have all of these people coming and going. There's, uh, there can be noise. That, that some people complained about that in the case of the hacker house that was in College Terrace. They said there are strange people that are standing around on the street at all hours of the day, night, smoking cigarettes and walking up and down the street. Mm -hmm. And my kids can't even go out and play in the yard anymore. You know, or or this house is right next to my house, yeah. and there's a big, uh, you know, there's a low fence there, and these people can see right into the yard, and I don't know whether or not it's a child molester who's who's there. We just have no idea. Yeah, well. strong safety concerns. Yeah. Strong safety concerns, yeah. but you know, I think there, a lot of the outrage comes from this idea also that you have these people coming and going with multiple cars, uh, clogging up neighborhoods that are already having problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Um, that Reminds me that some of the council candidates were talking about if there's a lack of ability to enforce codes, maybe we should just, you know, outlaw things that need enforcement <laughs> action. There's only four code, code enforcement officers. Um, is it through the planning department or the police department? The planning department. Planning department. But if you outlaw yeah. things, don't you still need code enforcement to kind yeah, of right, right. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> enforce them? Yeah. This makes it less obvious that you, that you can that you can do something. One of the other things that, you know, I mean, certainly um, quality of life issues mm -hmm. for um, the whole sense of neighborhood cohesiveness is another thing yeah. that people have brought up, that if you have a family or even an individual who's a homeowner living in a house, um, they are more likely to be engaged with the community about things like schools, uh, the government, you know, taking, taking part in the city and the community and the neighborhood. But if you have people who are only there for just a few weeks at a time, they really have no stake in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and they just, you know, that it, it somehow it shreds the uh, that whole sense of, of community that mm -hmm. you have. Yeah. So the neighbors would say that it's a specious argument to say that hey, we're providing housing for all these people who can't right. afford to live here because really, if someone's just staying for two weeks, it's not really providing right. housing. And yeah, some would say it's quite the opposite. You're taking a real housing off the market and turning it into a hotel. Well, mm -hmm. that's the other thing. That was another right. argument that people made is that if you can rent out, to, let's say, to 14 people. This is just theoretically, mm -hmm. um, and you can get, let's say, a thousand dollars a month out of each person. Then, what does that do to the housing prices? You know, the rental prices for other houses because you suddenly inflated the value of, of rents. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's interesting is that you know the, the argument that the, you're going to make housing for people. It's really just a drop in the bucket when you think that. I believe that the county came out with some figures in which. Uh, I think there are a couple of nonprofit think tanks that basically said that there, the Santa Clara County needs like 67,000, more than 67,000 homes or units basically mm -hmm. for just for low income and very low income people. Mm -hmm. So that's countywide, of course, but you do have this, this issue of you know, how are you going to, you'd have to have an awful lot of overcrowding in neighborhoods mm -hmm. and change the whole quality of the neighborhood. Well, the counter argument to that would be that any any action you could take on housing in Palo Alto would be a drop in the bucket. Yeah. So you have to do all of them, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's whether or not you're going to change the character of uh, single family um, neighborhoods. The R1s, yeah, yeah. The R1s, or if you're going to, you know, are they going to become multifamily? And mm -hmm. Do we have them be R2? R2s, R5s, R15s, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, or are they going to basically be uh, remain what they have always been traditionally? So yeah. where are you going to put people? That 
will be the topic of another behind the headlines. <laughs> and many more council meetings. <laughs> and many council meetings. And certainly uh, by the indications that we've had from the council candidates, Airbnb will definitely be coming coming to the council at some point. Uh, I certainly expect so. The next yeah. year. Okay. All right, well, that's it for Behind the Headlines for this week. Um, you can definitely see those endorsement interviews on youtube.com slash PA Weekly and read Janati's coverage of the 11 council candidates in this week's uh, Palo Alto Weekly. Catch it on the newsstand or it should be in your mailbox. Um, and we'll see you next week. All right.